something you've been putting off. Maybe you say, someday I'll do that, or when I have more time. Whether the item is a big bucket list item or something smaller like going on a hike, now is the time to start your say yes list. And we have the perfect process to help you turn these items into reality. Join thousands of others with our free Say Yes list template at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. It'll help you stop living in that someday and start making those list items come true today. So download it now at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. Welcome to the Say Yes Experience podcast, where we inspire you to get out of your comfort zone and into possibilities. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. If you're new here, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. I'm Jessica Rector. I co-founded the Say Yes Experience with my then nine-year-old son, Blaze, based off his idea to let's just say yes to things. I'm one of the top experts on burnout, and companies and conferences hire me to present on mental health, wellness, and burnout prevention. As the number one best-selling author of 11 books, keynote speaker, and a burnout specialist, I've seen so much with our clients. The Say Yes Experience was started to help you really start living, to do the things that light you up, have more fun, and turn your dreams, or what we call Say Yes list items, into reality. So thank you for investing in yourself and being here. Now let's make it happen. The power of say yes, build your confidence to say yes to other situations, even if you don't have the know-how or experience. Our guest today knows this all too well. She'll share how her ability to say yes early in her career led to more opportunities and bigger outcomes at work, which forged the path to her being a real estate investor and the CEO of a multi-million dollar company who helps organizations win more business. You'll be on the edge of your seat with her profound insight into the habits you need to better prepare for change and tackle challenges so you can be your rock star, amazing self. So please help me welcome my special guest today and good friend today. I call her super genius, but you can call her Lisa Rorick. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thanks, Jessica. I'm so excited to be here and chatting with you on your Say Yes podcast. This is amazing. Yeah, no, no pressure on the super genius part, but I just can't help because that is really, you know, you have so much brilliance and so much wisdom. So I know people are going to get a lot out of us chatting here today. So take us back to really the realm that we're going to talk about today is how you can say yes in your business, in your career and the work environment. So take us back to one of those moments that came up for you because then it led to all these other different say yes experiences, but really led you on the trajectory and where you are in your career and in business right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I was working for a big global consulting firm. I had been there for a couple of years, but I was not a subject matter expert by any means. It was pretty technical, the technical expertise that they uh, consulted on. And I had just gotten a promotion and I had this job, it, it's kind of a big job called business development consultant. I was creating a brand new department. So it was super exciting. I was maybe six or seven months in. And one day, one of the partners, his name is Steve, walked into my office and he said, hey, Rehurik, you want to go, you want to work on a client project? And I was like, okay, not having any idea what that was going to mean, right? So I'm saying, okay. And he said, great. Meet me for breakfast at the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville day after tomorrow. Well, I live in Phoenix. So this is kind of a big deal. I'm like, Nashville, what? Okay. I said, do I need to know anything? And he said, I'll send you a bunch of stuff to read on the plane. I'll see you there. And he zipped out of my office. The conversation was probably about three and a half minutes. It was kind of crazy. And what was kind of fun about it is what I learned later is that my boss at the time and Steve were in this conundrum. They had this client project. They were like, we don't have any staff to take care to to help you with this. What are we going to do? So they sat in the boardroom with the phone list and they went through the phone list looking for, okay, who could we pull from other projects to yeah. how creative can we get, right? So yeah. they get E's and they go and they talk to this other woman whose last name started with an E and they said, hey, do you want to work on this project? And she was like, mm, I don't know. She started asking all these questions. Well, how much time is it going to take? How long will be away from home? So she just started 
asking too much too soon. And they said, never mind, we don't want you. So they moved on and they got to the R's, which my last name starts with an R. And my boss at the time said to Steve, take Rehurik, take Rehurik. And Steve was like, heck no, Rehurik doesn't know anything about what we do. I didn't know Steve very well at the time. I not know anything about what we do. I'm not taking Rehurik. And he said, take her. She's going to, I promise you she'll have your back. Take Rehurik. Love it. So what's cool is Steve also in that moment had to stay, say yes, right? He had to step up and say, okay, yes, I'm going to take a gamble on this girl that I don't know anything about. He came into me and said what he said, and I said yes. And it really did change the trajectory of my career from that moment on in that say yes. And it was kind of sort of dumb luck that I that I said yes, kind of naivete, but it was awesome. So what happens when you get to Nashville then? <laughs> we get to Nashville. Steve says, I'm going to meet you for breakfast and I'll fill you in on everything. So I get to breakfast, but it's not just Steve and I. It's Steve and I and two high-powered lawyers out of DC. And I'm like, what is going on? And he's like, change of plans. I don't have time to explain. Just listen in, you know, gather all you can. And then we're off to the governor's office. So we had breakfast. I had no idea what they were talking about. It was all very technical uh, Medicaid healthcare stuff. And we literally... Um, jet off to the Capitol to have a meeting in the governor's office. And I feel like one of those interns, right? That's like carrying a stack of papers, papers flying everywhere. I'm running, trying to keep keep up. They're walking super fast. They're like super high powered. And I'm like, what am I doing here? I am such a fish out of water. I was freaking out. And we go, we have this meeting. And as we leave, Steve says to me, I need you to take more notes and ask more questions. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, I couldn't write fast enough to take any notes. It was unbelievable. And I don't know how it went uphill from there, but it did. It was pretty amazing. That is so incredible. So how did you get through that meeting, like really not knowing what you didn't know, not knowing the language or what they're talking about? And then when Steve is saying, okay, we'll take more notes, ask more questions, where did you even start? Because I think a lot of people, A, won't say yes to that unless they feel completely confident that they know what that next step is, that they can see all those step steps lined up, right? Okay, well, I can see step one in all the way through 10, as opposed to, I have no idea what this even entails. You can't even see step one, but I'm going to say yes. And then you get into that and it would be easy to just say, this is not for me. Take off. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything about Medicaid. Like you just leave. So what makes you say, okay, well, I'm going to stay in it and learn the things that he's talking about, even to know how to ask better questions. You know, it's interesting because again, I think I said yes out of pure naivete, to be honest with you. But there was a big yes in there for me to stay with it, to your point, right? There was a huge yes for me to yeah. stick and, and keep going. I went back to my hotel that night and cried. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I called a friend who also worked at the same company. And I said, okay, I have a whole bunch of acronyms that I had written down. Help me understand what this is. Can you give me the basics of Medicaid 101? And he stayed on the phone with me probably for 45 minutes and just talking things. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get through this. I mean, in that meeting, Jessica, to be honest with you, I felt like I was going to cry. I mean, I could feel those mm-hmm. cheers like up and I had to I had to prevent myself from crying and losing it in the meeting because I was like oh my gosh I don't know what's going on and I know there's probably a couple of points where I where I maybe even blacked out a little bit which is probably where he was like take more notes like probably just froze because I was trying so hard to not cry but I did in the meeting write down as much as I could keep up with so I don't know why he was saying take more notes because I felt like I was taking a lot, but it was probably those moments. And then I just, I got on the phone with that friend after my crying fit. I, and I just researched the heck out of stuff. And, and Steve ended up being one of my all time favorite mentors. Very, very easy to ask questions to. So I, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, I don't even know what question to ask. Yes. I go far back that I don't even know what question to ask. So I do remember being scared to ask him a really basic question, which was like, what is the objective of this project? That I didn't understand that. And so once I asked that question, 
it opened him up mm-hmm. to kind of base baseline information that dovetailed in with the information my friend had given me. And I just, I started learning from that point out, but there were moments where I'm like, I don't know what these people are talking about. Well, and saying yes to giving yourself permission to even ask those questions, putting yourself out there, because, you know, a lot of times we don't want to ask questions. What if Steve thinks I'm dumb? What if he's going to say, well, gosh, I hired, I brought in the wrong person. I should have said, you know, listen to myself and not brought in her to begin with, you know, all those kind of that self-talk that goes on in our head. But one thing I also love about you is how resourceful you are. So tell us a little bit about being resourceful, you know, not just picking up the phone and calling your friend and him helping you for 45 minutes, but how being resourceful just in that project and with that learning all those different terms and the ways of doing things has then trickled out into other areas of your life as well. Yeah, resourcefulness. I think in, I think that's one of the things that that whole say yes moment did for me is help me be even more resourceful. I came from the hospitality industry. And to be honest, you have to be resourceful in the hospitality industry. I worked in hotels, small motels. They don't have a lot of money. So you've got to get creative, right? But I just remember Googling things and Googling things in different ways. And then I would ask different people when I was alone with, say, the lawyer, I would ask each one of them a different question so that I wasn't piling it all on to Steve and mm-hmm. looking like an idiot. I did not know at that time that Steve didn't want to take me. If I had known that, that probably would have been all sorts of mind stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I would say with resourcefulness, one of the things for me was I was super curious I was just really curious about what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Why is the state doing this? How does Medicaid fit into everything? And so I was just asking very curious questions. If I found that if you're curious, mm. it, from a different that question ends up coming from a different place and it feels to the receiver of the question, it feels more curious than dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that perspective. That's, yeah. uh, that's if you're more curious, it comes more out of curiosity than from a place of not knowing. I love that. And one of the things that you and I have talked about several times are coping skills. So I know you felt like in the moment that you were going to cry and you had to hold yourself back. And I think when we're inundated with a lot of information that we don't know in a short period of time, it's easy to kind of black out, right? Where we're looking at someone and we kind of just have this like (laughs) dazed look on our face and maybe that was the pause in the note taking right but it's it but it's easy to do that because our brain takes time to process and catch up with what someone's saying and then we're like i have no idea what you're even talking about so i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to figure that out so maybe in the moment you didn't have, you know, the expert coping skills on, but in some ways you did because you stopped yourself from from crying in the moment, right? So how do you find or have you found that coping skills has really gotten you through those type of times and has really helped you in your career and coping with different challenges and issues and situations, different personalities? that come up, especially as someone now who runs and owns a multi-million dollar company. So how have those coping skills from back then really helped you throughout your career? Yeah, it's coping skills are interesting. And you know, because this is like my, uh, if I could get up on a big stage and talk about anything, I'd be talking about coping skills, because I do think, I believe, so for your listeners, because I know you know this, I believe that if we all learned coping skills earlier in life, that it would solve a lot of our problems, right? And it's interesting because it's really hard to just say with coping skills, like here's three steps you can do. But for me, one of the things is like, okay, taking a deep breath, just catching your breath, because in the moment when we are swimming in our heads about all of the bad things that are happening and you get stuck in that negative swirl, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, here's all the stuff that's happening. Yeah. Take a breath and actually be aware of what's happening in the moment. And that sounds so simple, but it's really hard to do when we're in that moment. And you've got to pull yourself out of the, this is happening to me Mm -hmm. and spiraling in that space of why is this happening to me? Oh my gosh, this is happening to me. Oh my gosh, this is so horrible. How am I ever going to get out of this? 
If you can stop and take a few breaths and just identify, okay, here's what's happening right now. And then kind of putting a face and a, a name to it, like this is what's happening right now. Here's what's happening. All right. Now, how am I going to get out of this? Because at that point, it doesn't matter anymore that it's happening, right? It's already happened. It's already mm. done. And you have two choices. You have a choice to sit and spin in that, continue to spin, or figure out how to get out of it. Nobody's coming to save you, right? Nobody's put right. out for you. So mm -hmm. what do you get out of it? And just teeny tiny baby step. There's actually kind of two things there. There's one of like, okay, what's the next best action? Tiny little baby step that I can take to move it forward. But the other piece is you got to believe that it's fixable. Almost everything in the world is fixable. You got to believe it's fixable and you got to believe in yourself that you can fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's more mindset stuff, right? Right. But all encompassed in how do you cope with a situation that is scary or depressing or whatever? You got to put a face to it. You got to believe in yourself. You got to take some steps forward. You got to handle it yourself because nobody's going to do it for you. Right. Man, I'm getting all like teary eyed listening to you. Do you want to start saying yes, but you just don't know where to start? And oftentimes when we don't know where to start, we just don't start. So we created an ebook just for you. We put together 101 ways to say yes in this ebook. Ideas, big and small, things that only take a small amount of time, like one to two minutes. Whether you're saying yes to yourself and your family, relationships, or pushing yourself a lovingly outside of your comfort zone with adventures, it's all made to really help you become more of your rock star self. So you can get this ebook at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book, B-O-O-K. So if you want to start saying yes, or maybe you need some ideas on how to say yes because you get so caught up in being busy and doing tasks and projects or doing laundry and cooking that the time flies by and you want to spend time with your family, but you just don't know how to say yes. Those ideas just don't come to you. We put it together to make it super, super easy for you. So go to thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book to get your copy today and start saying yes now. Are you feeling overwhelmed, stressed, or burned out? We get it. You're not alone. In fact, according to our research, 79% of the workforce is in burnout and almost half are in extreme burnout. In fact, it's the number one reason why people are leaving organizations. They're burned out. They're looking for something more. They're looking for something better. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have your solution. It's called Blaze Your Brain to Extinguish Burnout. 52 Keys to Prevent, Breakthrough, and Eliminate Burnout. You can find your copy at jessicarector.com forward slash store. Now, this is a great tool that you can use with yourself, with your colleagues, within your organization. Everyone can get one and you can go through one a week with them. And at the end, you can say, what was something that worked this week? What was the success you had? So you can champion and encourage each other. You can also ask what were the challenges and issues that came up so you can mastermind and brainstorm around those to keep those from coming up in the future. So make sure you get your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. You know, you and I have had this conversation about coping skills numerous, numerous times, right? But I'm getting like kind of emotional listening to you, you know, because I just saw you through a different lens for a moment and how really brilliant you are. So I'm getting like all choked up because I'm like, gosh, like I knew she was super genius. I knew she was brilliant, but dang, she is really, really brilliant. So, so like my eyes are watering and I'm, I'm about to cry because I'm just so blessed to have you as a friend because you're, you're so brilliant and wise. Um, anyways, well, unexpected emotions coming up here. <laughs> I don't Anyways, and then that, like we're talking about coping skills, like nothing even like emotional, but I'm like, gosh, I'm so thankful to have you as a friend because you just impart so much wisdom on me and I know on so many other people. So one of the things that you have shared with me that I think has really been 
is so important in my life and made an impact in my life is also what part do I play in that? What is my role in that? And so tell me a little bit about that because I think that's such a powerful question because it's easy for us when situations happen or challenges happen to blame someone else or say, this happened to me, but what is my part in that? What role do I play in that? And then when we start asking ourselves that question, then what happens next? What have you found in asking yourself that? What happens next for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a it's a big piece. That I think again, of coping skills to some degree, right? Of saying, okay, mm-hmm. let's say my sister and I had a heated political discussion, right? And think about this. Probably everybody listening can relate to having a heated discussion about anything with somebody. And you walk, you're like, oh my god, they were such an they were such a jerk, or they were so mean, or they couldn't hear anything. Mm-hmm. And end of the day, you can't control anything that the other person does, right? You can't control that the person at the Front desk the hotel was really rude to you. You can't control that. You know, you got a flat tire on the freeway. You can't control any of that. What you can control is your reaction. So to stop and say, okay, in this argument with my sister, what does she own and what do I own? And I can only care and work on what I own. So if I spend a lot of time worrying about what she did, what she said, what she controls and all of that, what's the point? It's it's a waste of time. It is a complete waste of time, energy, stress, and all of that. All I can own is me. And so I can dissect that and say, okay, what, what do I own in this moment? And what can I do better next time? And what that does is that it relieves a whole lot of stress because you let go of the stuff you can't control. That's dangerous for us to hold on to because you can't do anything. Why are you holding on to it? And then it also helps you grow. The more that you ask that question to yourself, what can I own in this moment? The more you grow. If you're willing to do that, you've got to be willing to do all of this because it's not always easy. Because it's mm-hmm. real put that mirror up and go, man, I own this, this, and this. I don't want to admit it. And then once you put a face to it, kind of with what I was saying earlier, once you put a face to it, it's easier to work through it. The hardest part is the awareness and putting a face to it and saying, okay, I've got a piece in this. What am I going to do with that? Mm-hmm. So I, I am a huge proponent of that. And I, I don't always do it, but I try to do it as much as possible. It's a really great emotionally intelligent practice mm-hmm. that I can hear that really helps me with my worry and my stress and all that stuff. Yeah. And ever since you shared that with me, I try and do it every time that a conflict comes up or an issue comes up. And there's only been one time that I can recall saying, you know what? There was nothing in there that was me. Like I did my best, but most of the time were, you know, is it our tone of voice? Is it what we said, how we said it? Were we, you know, empathetic or compassionate to them? You know, most of the time, if we take the time to ask that question, there's going to be a part in there for us to own And then what you do with that is all up to you, right? And when you decide to apologize, when you decide to open that conversation up with the other person and say, okay, you know, this was my part and that I own that part, it starts also building those deeper connections and and it mends things faster is what I found as well. It does. And it also gives, it, it develops a deeper connection with yourself right? Because it really is easy for us to say, well, I don't own anything in that. I own nothing. And then if you really think about it, you're like, oh, I do own that that flat tire on the freeway. I, it, very easy for me to say, well, what could I possibly own there? Well, when was the last time I le- had my tires serviced, right? Right. Hey, so I should have had my tires serviced because I have never had them serviced. And I know better for next time. You can forgive yourself and move on and let go of the happening of the actual events, right? Yes, and being able to move to move on and not not hold on to that because, you know, things like that we tend to play over and over, but it's also extremely liberating and freeing to just say, "Oh my gosh, like I'm letting this go. Here's what I know. Here's the lesson I learned so I can move on." And if something similar happens again, that you know, this is the lesson I learned that I need to go get my tire service. So I'm going to try and keep that from happening another time and another time. So it actually saves you a lot of 
time and frustration as well in the process. So you have that big say yes, and then it led to another say yes at work. So tell us kind of what it led to, which then became, I feel, this huge say yes into what led you down the path of where you are now. Yeah, sorry, I was having a little bit of a coughing attack there. Um, Actually, there was a pre-say yes to that story. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, when I started at that company, I was the office manager and office manager, executive assistant. And we were busting at the scene. We had so many employees. People were working in the hallways and makeshift desks. And we had to move to a new building, 20,000 square foot, empty, empty space. And I remember my boss asking me like, hey, you want to be involved in that project? And I said, yes. Absolutely. How fun would that be, right? Yeah. And I remember the day that the guy, our the corporate real estate guy from Chicago called me and said, hey, this is yada, yada, yada. Do you, you know, how do you feel about project managing this? And again, kind of dumb luck or uh, destiny, call it, right? I was like, sure, absolutely. Because it sounded like a really exciting thing to do. And I had no idea what it meant. And really what it meant was I was managing the contractors, the designers, I was picking furniture, I was managing an internal team of executives and kind of them voting on things. I was managing a move for a consulting that, by the way, consulting firms make their money when people are working, right? And so if, if there's downtime, you're losing money. So it's very important that the move went smoothly, that the phone system or the computers and all of this stuff that I really knew nothing about. And thank God I had really great people around me. And I, I, I'm a pretty good project manager. I can manage things really well. But that was the first thing that happened. I said yes to that. I did a, did a great job. Then from there, I got that promotion to that business development consultant role. And that's when I, I had kind of that initial say yes that you talked about here. So it was this flow of yeses that again, maybe I was a little naive saying yes, but I just wanted opportunity and I was excited to try to try new things. And I didn't know enough to say no, but they were both amazing for me in my career. And uh, yeah, I, I would never, it would be hard for me to say no to opportunities from from those two instances, just because of everything that I gained from that. It put me in that position to know I can be scared and I can still do stuff. I can want to cry at any I can still pull it out and have these two, one of those two high-powered lawyers to this day tells me, you're one of the best project managers I've ever worked with. What? I didn't know anything. So it's pretty amazing what we can do when we just allow it to come in. And taking what you learned from those experiences and taking it into the rest of your career with you. So do you think from that you've been able to See where opportunities present themselves better because there's so many times in life and in every day that there's opportunities presenting themselves, but maybe you don't look at it as opportunities. Maybe you just say, no, I can't do that because I don't have the skill set. Whereas you're, if you just look at it and change it, tweak that a little bit and look at an opportunity, it can change everything else that comes after. So has it gotten you better at looking for opportunities or seeing things that present themselves and creating opportunities from those things. Yeah. You know, it did a couple of things. Everything was just saying yes. Um, But also all my, all my life, I felt like I needed to have a better plan for how things were going to go because that's just what I was taught and what I saw in people around me and my family, right? Like you've got to know what your next step is. You've got to know what your career is going to be. And what, those experiences taught me was that it's okay to not know. And frankly, in a lot of ways, it's better to not know. Because if I had had a plan, I would have never said yes to those things because Mm. they my plan. So now I can much more appreciative of those, of things that come along. And I am so wide open to what's just going to come and show up at my door and ask me to be in Nashville in two days. Like, what is the next one of those, right? And it used to be, uh, in my mind, a bad thing. And now I know it's a good thing. Not that it's not good to have plans, but to be open to the possibilities of things. If if you're over-planned, you're not going to see things. You're just 
you know, you're going to have blinders on. So what if I had said no to those things? What if, oh my gosh, my life would be so much different. And so I do keep a very wide open mind. I keep my eyes wide open for anything that comes to me. That I don't well, and one of the things that was coming up in my mind when you were saying that is one of the things I believe that's led me to have a successful business and you know, especially in the last few years, because it wasn't, as we both know, wasn't always that way for us. But what's allowed me to do that is betting on me, meaning I feel like that's what you did. You said yes, and then you bet on you, even not necessarily in a conscious way, but maybe in a subconscious way, where at the end of the day, you were resourceful, you learned coping skills, even if you didn't have them initially, those are things that we can all learn. But and then you got better, but you always bet on yourself to figure it out, to find out the best questions to ask or to find someone who could help you throughout that. And so what would you say to really, if you're feeling insecure, how to at the end of the day, just bet on yourself to figure things out? Because I think that's also kind of a, a lesson to learn as well. You know, it really is. And I don't know that I had that trust and belief in myself going into that consciously to your point, right? I don't know that it was conscious, but whenever I get stuck in a situation, I look back at that and I'm like, I can figure anything out. I trust that I can figure anything out. And in t today's world, it's even easier because we have resources around us everywhere. Mm -hmm. I would, I trust in my ability to figure anything out. I trust in my ability to, I trust in the relationships that I've built, that I have people that I can go to to ask dumb questions to like, hey, I don't know what I need to do here, but I need help. And sometimes, and you've seen this with me, right? Like sometimes we reach out and say, hey, I need help with this. Here's what my challenge is. And by the time you saying what your challenge is, you figured it out, right? You figured it out. <laughs> so, we all have that ability and it's a matter of tapping into it. And if you're somebody listening now that you're like, I don't trust myself. I don't believe in myself. How do I start with that? You start with the smallest thing that you can find that you believe in of yourself. There's something there that you believe. Hold on to that and start building on it. Journal on it. There's so much more there than you know that you trust yourself every day naturally about, right? And we just have to build on that to get to the bigger things and trust that you have the resources, whether it's people in your in your corner, whether it's Google. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, a prior coach, I shouldn't call her old, a prior business coach who used to say, everything, you can, you can find anything either with Google or God. One of those two things, right? <laughs> and Marie Forleo says, everything is figure outable. Yes. Everything is figure outable, right? And I say, oh, because if you're stage four cancer, you know, that's a little bit of a different story, but everything in our daily, day-to-day -day lives is figure outable. You just have to get up exactly. and and learn how to be resourceful. It doesn't just come naturally. You learn it over time. Thank you so much for being here, Lisa. We could talk all day with all your super geniusness. And I know that you learned a lot golden nuggets from her. So whether it's being resourceful or coping skills or saying yes and the work environment and business, looking for opportunities and betting on yourself at the end of the day. So go out there and be amazing at work and in life. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Are you ready to move to your next level of rock star greatness? CFO, Chief Fund Officer, number one best-selling author and keynote speaker, Blaze Rector is ready to help you do that. At just 10 years old, he's already written two number one best-selling books. Through the power of storytelling, he uses lessons learned and shares strategies, tips, tactics, and tools to inspire, empower, and motivate you to live a more amazing life. So if you're ready to do that in your own life, grab a copy of his number one best-selling books at justcorrector.com forward slash store. And when you order your copies, he will personally autograph them and write you a message on those books before shipping them out to you to really inspire and empower you in your life. These books are great for adults 
and kids alike. So if you're ready to move to your next level of rock star greatness, make sure you grab your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. Enjoy those amazing, empowering, transformational books. Did you know that the two biggest issues impacting the workforce are mental health and burnout? Well, we have your solution. The more that you feel burned out, the more it impacts your mental health. The more your mental health is impacted, the more it leads to burnout. So it's a vicious cycle that goes around and around, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can help them both if you're intentional and strategic with it. We have lots of resources for you at justcorrector.com forward slash store. One that I want to highlight that really enhances your mental health is Tame Your Brain Game, 52 Tips to Turn Negative Thoughts into Positive Action. Now, research shows that 80% of your thoughts are negative. No matter how positive you feel, it's the pattern and the habit that you've developed over the course of years, over the course of decades. And that can often impact your life, how you show up, how you lead, how you communicate, how you engage, whether at work or at home. And then it also impacts a work environment. All you need is one NN or TT, negative Nancy or toxic Tim to really impact that work environment. So if you are ready to enhance your mental health, get your copy of Tame Your Brain Game, 52 Tips to Turn Negative Thoughts into Positive Action today at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. Thank you so much for being here. Check us out at thesayyesexperience.com. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. With your help in sharing our podcast, we can do that. Follow us on all social media at the Say Yes Experience and join our free community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Say Yes Experience. Thank you again to our guest. You can find all the contact information for our guest in the show notes. Thank you to our CFO, Chief Fun Officer, Blaze Rector, our business advisor, Lisa Rehurek, and to our team at Jessica Rector Enterprises. We look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Have an amazing day and keep being a rock star.